And so we are recording now. Um, I'm going to introduce our guest tonight and then uh, she can take it away. So first of all, I want first of all, I want to say thank you very much to Dr. Uh, Shanaz Kama, who is joining us at five in the morning <laughs> from India. So thank you so much for the, the sacrifice uh, to get up so early and to to join us. I also want to say we're thinking of everybody in India during this very difficult time. I know that COVID is striking hard and our prayers and thoughts are with everybody in India struggling with this all around the world. But I know that in India, it's particularly rough right now. So our thoughts are with everybody. And let me do, let me introduce uh, Dr. Shernaz Kama. She is the director of the UNESCO Parzor Project for the preservation and promotion of Parsi Zoroastrian culture and heritage. And in this capacity, she has traveled across India, recording oral traditions and creating awareness of the rich culture and heritage of this community. And she's been teaching at the University of Delhi since 1983 and has authored and edited books on a variety of topics, ranging from literature to art. And tonight she's going to focus on embroidery. Um, and I know she's, she speaks at the UN, she speaks uh, all around the world, uh, sharing her knowledge, promoting uh, the preservation of Zoroastrian, Parsi Zoroastrian culture and heritage. And it is with, uh, with great uh, pleasure that we welcome Shirnaz Kama tonight to our Zamli Zoom session. So Shirnaz, welcome. Thank you so much, Anne, and welcome friends. Uh, I really appreciate the sacrifice of Jaru and Karishma, who must be at two o'clock in the morning watching over here. I hope it's worth your while. Uh, Anne and team, thank you very, very much. I'm grateful to you for having taken over the slides because the brain is not exactly at its bright, especially since my son was speaking at Cambridge last night. So I was up. That's why I got a bit late coming on today. So anyway, uh, Behram, thank you for putting us in touch. It's great to see so many friends and I'm grateful to you for being over here. Uh, if we could start with slide one, I'd like to start talking about it. And can you just enlarge the slide, please? Thank you. Okay. Uh, this, of course, is our famous portrait donated by, uh, by um, Ava Kullar, our president, who unfortunately is down with COVID right now. Um, she donated this. It's a portrait of Jarbano Kanga, her great aunt who died in Nagpur in 1925. And her husband has this portrait uh, created. It's got real little pearls on it. It's very small. It's smaller, in fact, than the size you're seeing on your screen. But I want to first talk about the title, Painting with a Needle. Actually, painting with a needle is a term used in China, used by the Parsis, <clears throat> including uh, great aunts and my grandmother-in-law. And the whole idea of Zarthushti Duzi is something which is uh, well known in textile circles, even in the University of uh, Tehran textile division today. What I want you to note is the China, the Iran, and the India links. And I will be talking about the multicultural heritage of what we call Parsi embroidery. Uh, basically, there are linkages which go back to the Central Asian, uh, 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 Central Asian area. And I'm going to be talking today about the roots, R-O-O-T-S, and the roots, R-O-U-T-E-S, uh, of this, I would believe, one of the finest material cultures of the world. Uh, the roots and roots include, as you will see from the slides, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and even Semitic cultures. My point over the last 20 years has been to dispel certain myths and give you proof of the complexity of Parsi embroidery. I will be briefly showing you the geographical roots of how uh, it spread across Europe, this 
type of embroidery, which is very, very fine. And I also want to show you the historical roots from Achaemenian Iran the symbolism through the Silk Route into China and how very interestingly, this whole, uh, uh, this whole art form, I would call it an art form, no, not so much a craft form, finally returned to its originators through China and into India. Uh, so Parsi embroidery, very loosely and very wrongly called quote unquote Gara embroidery is an amalgamation of Iranian, Chinese, Indian, and European cultures. Uh, the Zathushtis have saved in their trunks and in their cupboards. And I grew up in a home with a large embroidery room and with cupboards filled with the most magnificent uh, boxes of colors, colored silk skeins of, uh, of, of silk floss and colors which range from the darkest purple through shades of purple into every single, I mean, you can't imagine the types of colors you saw when you opened those anchor boxes. So I speak both from personal knowledge as well as, which I'd forgotten, frankly, until I started this research. May I see slide two, please? Thank you, Anne. Uh, this is what I wanted to show you. Uh, this, if you can see the Simurg on the top, these are the earliest samples of world textiles. Uh, of course, the oldest are found in Egypt in Fustat. And what we see over here is what I've chosen to show you as the Zoroastrian symbols. You see the Simurg, you see the ram with the ribbons, if you can see my cursor, and you see uh, from Yasht 14, Vethrigdana of the Zoroastrian tradition. The interesting part, by the way, this ram with the ribbon symbolizes, of course, far of the kings or happiness and wealth. Uh, this is an important uh, piece of textile. It's actually from the Vardu Cathedral. It's now in the VNA Museum. And it shows the tree of all seeds. It shows the Ciro Khorshid or the, the sun. Can you see the sun emblems and the confronting lions? It has in down below, it has different types of panthers and other animals. And this symbol of the confronting lions and the sun is, has always been seen as a symbol of Persian royalty from the earliest times of King Jamshid. Next slide, please. Thank you. Xenophon talks about how Cyrus the Great uh, came into battle with his wearing a purple tunic, I'm quoting now, shot with white trousers of scarlet dye about his legs and a mantle all of purple. Uh, the color combination of purple, always a royal color, the, the dye was actually found, made, created from the shells of certain uh, sea creatures. And it's, it's a very, very expensive dye from the earliest times. And it's a very favorite color of the, of the Parsis who of course enjoyed their riches and their luxuries. And by the way, Cyrus uh, and all the, uh, the Greeks looked down upon the Persians because they found the men a little effeminate until of course they beat them in battle because they wore such rich clothing and they came into battle also with rich clothing. They learned their lesson when the Roman horses many, many generations later were defeated when they saw the Roman horses stampeded when they saw huge banners of silk uh, approaching them in the battlefield. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, this is, of course, Darius. And these are the immortals in glazed brick at Darius's uh, palace at Susa. I want you to please note the embroidery on the clothing. Uh, if you look at it in an enlarged form, you will see the border with the, I will be talking about this, 
with the rounders of pearls. And if you look at the color combinations, they range from white to gold to blue to many, many colors. And these are very beautiful embroidered clothes. Uh, next slide, please. I'd like you all to look at this slide a little closely because I have multiple examples of Parsi textiles and Zathushti textiles, Zathushti Duzi, uh, with the same trellis pattern or with this trellis pattern of the curve. The roundel of pearls, which I will keep talking about because that is one of our discoveries. Uh, if you look over here, it seems to have a type of Mithraic figure inside it. This pattern with little figures, this of course is from <clears throat> the Parthian statuary, but we will see this across not only centuries, but across millennia. So I would like you to remember this when I talk to you about it later. Uh, can I just see the next slide, please? This, of course, is the map of the known world at that time. The three Persian empires spread from the Mediterranean into Japan. Uh, the Duhang Caves are well known just now for their discoveries, which Jenny Rose has been working on, and a lot of people are now working on these. Uh, the Persians at this time were the middlemen, literally and geographically, uh, selling the silk from China to the West. They control the East-West route trade, and that is when I believe, and our researchers have found, we need to do much more, that the amalgamation and the interlinking of symbols and designs, not only in embroidery, but in many craft forms, began to appear. Uh, the historian Ferdinand von Richthofen named the channel to the East and West, along which the secret of silk first traveled, he called it the Silk Root, and that's the name by which we know this even today. Next slide, please. Uh, there are many, many stories and legends about <clears throat> this great silk weaving. And it's very important to know that, of course, silk has played a vital role in the evolution of embroidery. And sericulture originated in China. The traditional account, which is a very sweet story, is uh, that Silk's discovery is attributed to a 14-year-old <clears throat> concubine called Zi Ling Lotsu. Uh, she was sitting under a tree, very cute story, she was sitting under a tree when a cocoon fell into the cup of tea she was drinking, and while retrieving the cocoon, she literally unwound the secret of silk. The secret was zealously and jealously guarded until an other Chinese princess got married to a prince, a Parthian prince of Khotan. Uh, not wanting to be deprived of her favorite textile and knowing that it was not allowed to be taken out of China, the, she smuggled silkworm eggs and mulberry seeds inside her headdress. The guards at the borders were told never to allow silk to escape in form of worms or mulberries. But even the guards could not open up the headdress of a princess and spoil her elaborate hairstyle. Oh, this is one legend. The other legend, of course, which has been documented, and it's documented, by the way, in, in the Byzantine Empire, is that the Emperor Justinian uh, was desperate to find the secret of silk because he was paying so much for the silk coming down from the silk route. So he sent, please note the words, two Persian magi to China to find out quote, the secret of this wonderful fiber. They return with mulberry seeds and silkworms hidden inside a bamboo stick. So there are many, many legends and there's a lot 
which you can, uh, there are lots of oral traditions, there are lots of legends about how silk came into Persia and Persia was the second country to have silk after China. Next slide, please. And could you change the slide, please? Thank you. Uh, many, many centuries later, Marco Polo has reported that, quote, a thriving silk industry and suffer with weaves, twill, satin, lampas, brocade, and velvet were well known. Uh, he is very clear that the Iranians were famous for their textiles. And he describes, please have a look at this Paradise or Persian garden. He describes the embroidery of the Kerman women in silk of all colors with beast and birds and many other figures as a delight to the eye. I'd like you to look at this enclosed garden, the Paradise from which the word paradise comes and the figures particularly, this is in the Islamic period. Please note, Marco Polo traveled in the Islamic period and Islam normally forbids the portrayal of live figures. However, so firmly embedded was the, was the Zoroastrian tradition that the earlier motives from nature continued to be portrayed. People continued to be portrayed, not just in embroidery, but in carpets, in weaving, and in all aspects of creativity. Next slide, please. I was very fortunate to have been taken by Professor Almut Hinze to see this magnificent piece of our culture. Uh, Professor Ilya Gershwich was a great Iranian scholar. He had a lot of respect for Sir Percy Sykes, who had worked in the field and had traveled extensively across the greater Persian empire. This particular shawl, which I photographed on a phone, uh, was brought by Sir Percy Sykes from Northwestern Iran. I have considerable details of the study of the shawl. And I saw it after Professor Ilya had passed away. Uh, it is actually a very deep blue shawl. It's the largest shawl I have ever seen in embroidery. And I've seen a lot of Kashmiri shawls. Uh, it's a bridal shawl of Zatusti Duzi with motives ranging from the tree of life, if you can see the tree of life here. Uh, it has fish, it has peacocks. My favorite is the little dogs, which it has over here. It has a lot of roosters. It has, uh, if you can see the next slide, it may be close, it, clearer. Next slide, please, yeah. This is this. can you see the size of this shawl? We finally took it outside because the room in which Elizabeth Gershwich, Professor Ilya's widow, showed it to us was not big enough to take the entire unrolled shawl. Here you can see the tree of life. Here you can see the roosters. You can see the fish. Of course, in the center, the central roundel is the khurshid, the, uh, the, the sun, and you have uh, roosters, you have these dogs. It's an absolutely magnificent shawl. Unfortunately, uh, when Professor, uh, when sorry, when Elizabeth passed away, uh, she left the shawl to the embroiderer's guild, who has packed it away and will keep it packed away because they do not really know its value. Someday, I dream always that we can house a museum of Zatushti Duzi and Parsi embroidery because it is one of the world's great and forgotten textile traditions. Next slide, please. Uh, these uh, pictures were taken during Parzo research in Iran. Uh, we are very grateful to uh, Mobed Firozgari and uh, the late Merbanu Bhaktiari who helped Ashdeen during his research. If you note from the shawl, these are much later uh, embroidery uh, uh, skills, but they still have the little 
uh, the little dogs, they still have the roosters, they have the tree of life, the umbi or the paisley. And uh, there are many legends about this, which I need to learn from the Iranian diaspora because nobody uh, really wants to say with certainty why the silks, these are all silk by the way, why the silks were in strips very, very carefully stitched together. Uh, we were told that during, and we have this oral recording, that at a time of repression against the Zoroastrians, they were not allowed to buy full yardage and baskets of such strips were kept outside shops and they bought this and stitched it together. Others say that since the Zoroastrians liked bright colors, Khudabaksh colors, uh, they collected these to create a rainbow effect. I really need more details about this and would be grateful to anyone who can share details of why we have the strips of cloth uh, at a particular point in uh, Zoroastrian uh, history. Next slide, please. Uh, I hope you can see this carefully. And Mani and Homi, if you're remembering your Bharuch Ward home, you would remember these little niches or what we in Gujarati we call goklas, where in our oral recordings we found mirangs used to be placed over here for protection. The painting is typical of a Parsi house. This is one of a set of paintings which we have very luckily been allowed to photograph. Uh, this is a sace, if you can see it. There's a Devo, an oil lamp. Uh, then over here, you see an elderly lady, the senior most, wearing an embroidered blouse with bangles from India. All the women have mathubanus or the headdress covered head. And over that, they have their, their saris with an embroidered core or border. It's obviously a little prayer, a prayer ceremony because the elderly lady is reading from an avasta. There's an afarganyo placed on the carpet. And I love the little sapat or velvet slippers, which are off the carpet because it's a prayer scene. Uh, this is a typical Indian painting of around the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. In the next slide, I take you back to some of the symbols of Zoroastrianism found across textiles even till today. The rooster or the bird of Sarosh, which uh, literally is walking in procession across this Ijar, is uh, well known for driving away evil because it uh, crows every morning and the evil uh, is uh, chained up again in Mount Damavand, etc. It is still sacred in the Parsis and never eaten. In the Bundahishan, where most of our symbolism of embroidery comes from, it protects us at night, heralds the dawn and drives away evil forces. I want you to note the rooster because it is found primarily in children's clothing and in different forms, but primarily as a main symbol in children's clothings on jablas. Uh, the next symbol I want to show you is of course my favorite. And by the way, we have a magnificent core or a border done with some Parsi ladies golden retriever or Labrador dog. It, it, it is really something worth seeing, but I'm showing you two types of dogs over here. Uh, the prophet's love of dogs is legendary. In the Pelvi text, I quote, it is declared if a dog is asleep upon the road, it is not proper that man put a foot violently on the ground so that he becomes awake. I want you to note this sari. Those of you who are from Gujarat will note that it is a lahi sari, 
on gajji satin with a very intricate system of match stick tie and die and these were normally called quote unquote uh widows sarees okay they were worn by widows but they often have embroidery and borders and here you have a little dog the symbol of the karolia or the little spider karolia means spider in gujarati is oral legend which of course while in the zoroastrian text uh, there are certain creatures which are called quote unquote noxious in parsi tradition the karolia is never killed and like the chameleon or sadda mama it is protected the stories link with the escape of the zarthustis uh, for for over 100 years from not just persecution but death this little legend is that the zoroastrians were tired thirsty walking across the desert they saw a well and uh, they began drinking when they realized it was an ambush and there were uh, arab soldiers advancing they jumped into the well and the little karolia told them don't worry nobody will touch you while i am there and he quickly wove his web so thickly across the well mouth that when the arabs came and looked inside they said oh this is an old well and they walked away we have this symbol on many of our textiles and also on many of our sarees and uh, it's a it's a symbol that come continues till today the next three slides are going to show you please can we start changing uh these are taken from the bundahishan and i'm very happy that parzo research has revived this tradition of the angel of the day and the angel of the month in the bundahishan every single flower symbolizes an angel there are 30 archangels and angels days whose names are applied to the days or the roads of Uh, our calendar and we see these examples across textiles uh the sur firozgari and the surji kotwal have told me that yes in their childhood they remembered how they were told to try and place the flower of the day in their jashans for people and it's supposed to be auspicious to have the flower of your roj on your clothing i'm just showing you a few samples here i have the whole 30 and their plants also this is the lily of khordad this is of course ava yazad the water lily and you can see the water you have the marigold for fire we only found one marigold which symbolizes atar or adar then you have the red chrysanthemum for sarosh angel of prayer next slide please you have the 100 petal rose for din angel of religion next slide please you have minoram the flower the chrysanthemum is his flower and it represents the spirit of abiding peace in chinese textiles too the chrysanthemum is the flower of autumn this is a very unusual gara because it is one of the only Japanese garas that we have found in our collection it had gold thread right through it's falling to pieces but it's a magnificent example of our embroidery uh the next slide will show us the gule bulbul which is of course a part of the tradition of animals and birds in our textiles gule bulbul is purely from the persian tradition the confronting birds gule bulbul and the garden uh you can see the difference between this piece which is obviously by a more skilled woman and this piece where the birds i'm sorry to say don't look exactly very beautiful and the peacocks are cute i'd like you to note this trellis which i showed you the circlet of pearls which i'll be talking more about which we see in so many of our textiles the little white jasmine of wahumana is over here and uh in the next slide what you will see next slide please 
uh, is this circlet of pearls or the pearl roundel, which has uh, been replicated and this again was one of our Parzo discoveries. We kept wondering why we always had this little line of pearls in our saris and in some of our jablas. Uh, this this uh, symbolism actually is associated with Sasanian royalty. And this is, of course, a, 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 a statuary from from Persepolis. So it is much older than the Sasanian period. And then you, what you see is that uh, the Sasanian kings, this traveled into China in the Tang dynasty, but the Sasanian kings on their crowns, if you look at the a few pieces we have left of, uh, of uh, uh, rock carvings, they have a on their crowns, a circle of pearls. And you have to remember that pearls were a very valuable part of the Persian system of wealth. And they had this circlet, which pattern traveled into Tang, China. And then it came, it always has appeared in, uh, in Parsi textiles. It appears in some part in Tang, China and uh, Chinese textiles. But the Parsis have literally appropriated this as a very neat little uh, edging for their textiles. Uh, the next one is an unusual set of pictures, which I would like you to look at. Uh, the circlet of pearls over here, we have got these from Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. Uh, there is one very badly maintained piece from Central Asia in the National Museum at Delhi. But uh, these circlets with Indian lotuses, Indian peacocks, but the type of ribbon effect which I showed you in the, in the ram from a very early times is there in Central Asia. This is a very remarkable gaji Gara. If you can see this close up, you can actually see through the material. It is that fine. It's very finely woven silk. Now, this circlet of pearls is a very stylized circlet. There are Chinese, obviously Chinese figures in it, if you see over here, but there are also European angels. Uh, this Gara was being offered to us to add to our Parzor collection. As usual, we are broke, we couldn't buy it. I don't know if it has disappeared into the hands of foreign collectors or it is still there. This is the biggest problem we are facing and that is protecting our textiles. When I talk about our textiles, when I show our textiles, I am terrified because things we have exhibited have very quickly disappeared uh, later. And we then discover their ex-Italian museum, their in Y museum in the USA, or worse still, they are gone into private hands where nobody knows that where they actually are. Uh, the next slide is a very important slide. And I'd like to talk about it a little bit. For many years, Parsi Zoroastrians presumed and spread the notion that rich Parsi traders bought textiles from China for their wives. Parzo research has proved this is far too simplistic for this magnificent tradition. This is a royal robe from China. Embroidery in China was symbolic of the station of the wearer and it had very specific colors. They are golden yellow uh, pieces which could only be worn, the embroidery in gold and the color golden or yellow could only be worn in the emperor's household. Uh, this embroidery is perfectly symmetrical. It is really painting with a needle. If you have a bird on this side, you will have a bird on this side. It is also extremely stylized. 
because it is meant to be worn on fitted and stitched garments. Uh, this is why, of course, you have the, the sky symbols, etc., etc. Please keep this in mind as we turn to the next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, the adaptation of that stylized form from a fitted garment, which is never so big, to six yards of unstitched cloth is where the Parsi gara comes into being. Uh, the gara and the embroidery done in China originally for Parsi community members uh, has a lot of legends and stories. We have recorded in Nausari uh, how the story of the creation of the first gara has come down to us in oral tradition. A Parsi trader in Canton watching craftsmen embroider a garment requested them to embroider a full six yards of silk for his wife in India. This type of embroidery was never cheap and it is very, it was expensive even at that time. These pieces embroidered are in very heavy satin. Uh, they have no border or pallus and they seem like yardage, which is what they were. They were clearly Chinese in scene and they were produced in the great factories of China and the great embroidery schools of China. The next five slides show you the Chinese links. This is a border which we kept wondering what it was about. And then we discovered that the eight Taoist symbols of protection are all seen over here. It's in Kako of Forbidden Stitch. The lady had no idea what she what was in this uh, uh, core, nor did we till we began understanding. And Priya Mani, my first embroidery researcher, very carefully drew these out. And I hope this will become part of our large one large book, which I promised my late mother I will write. The next one shows you uh, the dragon. Now, this is where the adaptation comes into Parsi textiles. The dragon is a very important symbol across Chinese textiles, Chinese life, Chinese yardage, Chinese everything. In the Parsi tradition, we've only found one jabla with this dragon, which is obviously from a dragon kite uh, for the dragon festival. Uh, the next one shows you, next slide, please. The next one shows you the Simhar becoming mixed up with the Phoenix, becoming all sorts of uh, adaptations. This child's jabla has, can you see the ribbon on the top? You didn't have buttons on children's jablas because they would be painful. So you just had this little ribbon and uh, it's a beautiful uh, embroidery over here. But I want you to look carefully at the border because it is such a cute little rooster over here looking back at his chicks and his little wife hen is pecking away at the bottom. So you have this great symbol of the Simurg or the Phoenix, a sun type of symbolism, uh, the lilies and the flowers. And then you have the rooster, which appears across most children's jablas. And uh, uh, I don't know if we can go close up, but I was thrilled to discover the baby chicks at the bottom. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is what I wanted to show. Sorry, this didn't come on. This is, of course, the Simur from China, which is adapted. It looks like a somewhat like a peacock over here. So again, this is an amalgamated sort of embroidery. Uh, in the next slide, what you will see is fish. 
Fish is a symbol of fertility found in most cultures in the Central Asian and Chinese traditions. It has special relevance to Zoroastrian embroidery. It is called, of course, Ariz in, uh, in Iran. It is a symbol of fertility in the Zoroastrian tradition, which is why we have um, uh, fish, mavani machi, and now chocolate machi uh, at weddings, etc. This is a gara, which was obviously embroidered in China as an engagement gara, because the color red following the Indian tradition became the auspicious color for us, uh, not for the wedding, but for engagements. This is a remarkable piece, uh, ladies and gentlemen, because it has every symbol of aquatic life from prawns to eels to turtles uh, to octopus. There's one other picture of this where you might be able to see it a little more clearly. So these type of garas were very expensive. We have this one, thank God, is still protected. It's with uh, Zenobia Paistan Jamas, who has very kindly allowed us to uh, show it at our exhibitions, including Everlasting Flame. But this pattern was popular, not maybe in the detail which we have over here. And uh, there was one other gara which we saw, which with the same fish pattern, which unfortunately has disappeared into a private hand, not in India, but abroad. The next, of course, is I don't know how many of you know that you are wearing shoe or the bats in your clothes. Uh, these are butterflies, which you've seen this core, and these are butterflies over here. But we discovered that what we earlier thought were butterflies on enlarged photography turned out to be bats. Now, bats are... Butterflies, of course, are a very common form of embroidery. All of us, when we sat down for our first embroidery lessons, uh, always did little butterflies. They symbolize love, blah, blah, blah. And they are very common in European embroidery, in Chinese embroidery, and in every embroidery skill in the world. The bats were more unusual. And these bats or shoe, I would love someone to explain this symbol to me, and I've just yesterday been contacted by somebody from Japan who's studying uh, Zoroastrian textiles for the magazine Textiles Asia. Uh, these bats are supposed to be uh, very, very symbolic of the five blessings of Buddhism, health, long life, happiness, riches, and a peaceful death. Uh, in fact, when we began showing this, this is an, a piece which we shot in Ahmedabad. Uh, when we told the lady that, well, you have this bat, uh, she was a little worried that, oh my God, is it actually a good thing to have a bat on my core? We said, it's a very good thing. Just look after your core. And you can see these bats are much more realistic and uh, right now, bats are not very popular thanks to the COVID situation, but uh, these bats are supposed to be good luck symbols. Uh, the next symbol is my favorite, and this, I believe, is my special little ghost. When I was studying Parsi Jablas with Priya, I kept telling her that there's this little figure which comes on the front and the back of all the jablas. And we kept worrying and wondering and thinking that we were gone a little crazy. It appears in many, many forms. Uh, we tried to find out from China and we discovered that they had forgotten what it meant. Chinese researchers like Wenzhou who's been working with us have now rediscovered the symbol of the sacred or divine fungus. Can you see this form? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a form that comes in different aspects, but it is most common on children's jablas again, because before your naujyot, you were not protected with the sacred cord of the kasti and the sadra, which is your sacred armor. The rooster from the Zoroastrian tradition and the divine fungus from the Chinese tradition 
appear on the front and the back of most jablas, meaning full protection for the wearer. And this is something which uh, is also seen in our embroidery in sarees, but is most common on children's jablas. Here, of course, you see a little Chinese man with a very big peacock. So this again is not the Chinese proportionate uh, uh, embroidery, but it is an adaptation of a very big peacock, a very small man, and the deer, which is the only animal which can find the sacred fungus. That, of course, is for another lecture about the exact symbolism. Next slide, please. Cranes in uh, tradition, the Chinese tradition, are, of course, uh, representative of long life because, uh, and uh, fidelity in marriage because cranes mate for life like swans. The patterns of water, etc., are seen in a lot of garas with cranes. This is an entire Akki Bhareli Khako Sari of the Forbidden Stitch. The Forbidden Stitch, please note, is different from Kako in Gujarati means seed pearl. Again, the pearl Zoroastrian tradition from Iran. Kako, uh, I have personally seen a lady, the last uh, practitioner of the Kako in Ahmedabad, Khorshed Dastur, who promised to teach us this stitch at our first workshop. Uh, I have watched another member very close to me go blind because of her uh, embroidery of kako. She embroidered the last kako uh, core for my wedding many, many years before I ever got married, but she did go blind in the end. This kako stitch is not a peak and knot. It is a peak and knot with a variation which is a little twist in the tail. Uh, literally, it's like a tail going in. And the reason for this is it gives an effect of depth. Can you see the, diff the, the way in which the wings have been created over here? The lady didn't even know that this was a kako akhi bhareli sari. The word before the word gara came into popular uh, usage, was akhi bhareli means fully embroidered or ardhi bhareli, which means just the border and the pallav of the sari. Next, please. This is the only example which we have recorded of the, of the dogs of Fu. I first thought it was a little monkey, but we realized that actually it's a very important Chinese symbol which all of us have seen in the form of the lion of Fu, uh, which is seen outside Taoist temples in China, Tibet, Nepal, Sikkim, and in Buddhism, in temple art and in statues. These cute little dogs of Fu are protective symbols. And uh, they, again, again with the round of pearls at the bottom, they again symbolize protection. From the next slide, I want to show you how much work is still left to do. I've been 20 years at this work and I want to see at least one book come out in my lifetime, but I do want people to study this art form closely. Uh, if you see over here, you have the endless knot from Persepolis. The idea is that the endless knot is a Buddhist symbol. Persepolis and Achaemenian Zoroastrian empires were far before Buddhism. In the Sasanian times, we come to what we call the Chartak type of architecture, which is a dome on a, on a square, the skinch which is of course a very, very Persian architectural uh, symbol uh, and style from the Sasanian times onwards. 
from the earliest times of the Achaemenians till the Chinese influence, this endless knot appears across architecture. It comes into all sorts of textiles and carpets, etc. In Buddhism, it stands particularly in Tibetan Buddhism, which was closely linked with the Sasanian Empire. It stands for the eternal cycle of birth, suffering and death. Tibetan Buddhism influenced a lot of Central Asia. It, Buddhism itself replaced Zoroastrianism across Central Asia, including in the old caves where we had our fires, etc., in Tajikistan, areas like that. Buddhism was what replaced Zoroastrianism long before Islam. I do not understand the name, if we have a name for this form in Zoroastrianism, and I need researchers to study this further. This trellis pattern and the curved trellis appears across Parsi textiles. Next slide, please. This is a remarkable surti garo, a kobarelo. Chinese embroidery became a fashion statement and a fashion item uh, for the Parsis around 1700 when the great traders, Parsi traders, Gigi boy, et cetera, set up factories in Canton. They brought back saris for their wives as I've shown you in the Bhikkhu Maniksha Gara. Uh, later on, following adaptation to India, a border or a core developed. Then you had the pallu for the sida hat or the right-handed uh, sari worn in Gujarat. We have on record Roshan Gazdar, late Roshan Gazdar uh, of Calcutta, who remembers her grandmother traveling from and to Canton on Chinese junks, sitting with the ladies of the Gigi Boy and Tata families, working out patterns and tracing them with Neel. Neel is indigo ink, taking the patterns back for embroidery to China. However, this is not a Chinese gara. This is a Surti gara and explain a little more. Uh, Parsi women began embroidering and taking interest in embroidery when they began living with their husbands in the factory towns around the late 18th and early 19th century. We have recorded this aspect of development. We have got some fantastic photographs which I don't have the time for in Hong Kong and China. But how did Parsi women in India take this up? I want you to look carefully at this gara. I'm sorry, this picture doesn't show the scallops at the end. It has the trellis, it has the peacock, it has the endless knot. If Can you see this over here? And at the bottom, there are scallops. On the border, there are scallops. On the pallu, there are scallops. Uh, how did this happen? Weaving and embroidery, as we have seen, are ancient Persian skills as the demand for Parsis from Parsis grew and from all Parsis. Once the rich began uh, using this as a fashion statement, everybody wanted uh, embroidery uh, and this type of embroidery. Chinese workmen began setting up in Gujarat little factories along the Surat coast and right down into Maharashtra. Uh, by the way, in Bharuch, there is a family descended from the ferias or the traders. I don't know if Mani and uh, Homi can remember them. They are now doctors and dentists, but they are settled in the old court or the old town of Bharuch. Uh, over time, the designs became planned by Parsi women. If you notice in China, embroidery is very, very colorful. The Parsi sari began using only white or off-white, majorly only white or off-white, because it matched the long sadra that the women wore outside their blouse. It also matched the lace blouses they adapted from the European tradition. Now, 
I kept on wanting to study how the Parsi woman started doing Chinese embroidery. I've got a lot of records and on tape, of course, on, on video. Uh, one of the people we recorded is Mr. Bajan Bodhanwala of Baroda. He remembers pa Chinese ferias sitting on his grand, he was 90 by the when we were recording him, and that's 20 years ago. Uh, he remembers Chinese ferias sitting on his grandmother's veranda in Bharuch, sorry, yeah, in Bharuch, resting after lunch. Okay. Please remember Gujarati Jains would never touch silk because it was uh, upshukan or inauspicious to wear silk because it involved the killing of a silkworm. Uh, when the Chinese ferias came into Gujarat and came into Bharuch in winter to sell their goods, they used to carry these huge big uh, bags of embroidered, of embroidered textiles. By, by the way, they sold them by the weight. Okay, the heavier the weight, the more money you had to pay. Uh, in time, they came on bicycles, but they used to get tired. So a trust developed between the women of a particular household and the feria who had that lane for his, uh, for his sales. And the feria would leave his big bag and go out to sell. When he came back, he sat down in the afternoon rested, took out his opium pipe, took out his little uh, round uh, of embro round, uh, uh, embroidery, uh, uh, embroidery, um, what is it called, ring, and began doing embroidery. In the afternoon, the women had finished their household work. They began sitting on the verandas and watching these men embroider. Along with their own skill sets, they began acquiring the satin stitch, which by the way, we then developed into six types of satin stitch. When I talked about this with uh, Dr. Gillian uh, Wolfstang from uh, Leiden, the Textile Research Center, she came to Parzor and has worked with us. She says six types of satin stitch is absolutely incredible. But along with satin stitch, the Ari, the Zathushti Duzi, like the uh, bridal shawl, which I showed you, and the Gujarati chain stitch, which is called the Mochi stitch, all came into our textiles. We kept trying to date Parsi textiles and found in the vaults of the VNA in London, the oldest recorded coat embroidery by a Parsi woman, unquote. This was on a jabla bought for the great exhibition or the Crystal Palace exhibition of 1851. It is in these archives that we could date our Parsi textiles for the first time because none of us have kept these records. We don't have a record when a feria comes. Nobody writes down what you've paid or what, who has done the embroidery. This a little uh, a note which we have in the records at the VNA tells us Parsi uh, embroidery by a Parsi woman, Surat 18, uh, 1840 something. And that is how we began dating these uh, Parsi embroideries. Uh, the jabla is in an Ari stitch and uh, we have jablas in forbidden stitch. We have, that's the kako stitch and we have some in, uh, in satin stitch. Next slide, please. This is a remarkable example of multiculturalism. Here you see the Persian trellis the Chinese paisley with an Indian peacock and the umbi or the Indian paisley with the confronting birds from the Persian tradition or the gole bulbul. This is on the pallu of a, of a Parsi sari. There are several Parsi saris with these patterns. And if you see on top, of course, you have the usual birds. 
but this is a perfect example of multiculturalism. Next, please. Uh, this is a typical non-traditional color. It's almost orange. Parsi women were the first to socially interact with their European counterparts. So European designs like scallops, which you can see over here, uh, cutwork, which you can see at the edges over here, butterflies, of course, flowers, bows, etc., cetera, uh, were incorporated, leading to this unique amalgam of four distinct civilizational traditions. Next slide, please. Uh, these three, this set is from the early 20th century. It combines Chinese baskets of plenty with European bows, with cutwork. This is on a jacquard. And I want you to note, I'm not going into this in detail. I mean, I have enough for hours and hours and hours. Uh, in the 20th, early 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century, Embroidery for the Parsi woman of Gujarat became a means of economic sustenance. It was taught in Parsi schools and the newly opened, quote, Parsi women's industrial cooperatives, the most famous, of course, being the Ratan Tata Institute. However, it was also a very important and distinct skill for a lady. Just give me two minutes and I'll tell you about it. Shirin Mistry of Melbourne, Australia, uh, had wrote to me about her grandmother, and I'm quoting from her email of several of over a decade ago. Open quotes. Make the time to come over to my house and see my granny's fantastic art and patterns. She did the design for all our family garas. Granny also used to teach the very rich Parsi ladies. So all the Wadia women, J.N. Marshall's wife and daughters, etc etc learned from her by the way this is not so long ago this is within living memory so i also remember being begged to learn parsi embroidery in my family not by my grandmother but by uh, gula bilimoria who i've talked about who did the khako core for me she was our governess she managed to make me stitch a sadra for my wedding, but that's about it. Uh, I'm all thumbs when it comes to embroidery. And we were so busy getting PhDs, we didn't want to learn this art. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I want you to see the adaptation in the 20th century. Embroidery is very heavy and therefore it's not easy to wear gracefully. The solution in the 20th century became that you left the part which you tucked in at the back and what you tucked in in the front unembroidered so that you could tuck it in more easily and it would look more elegant and not like a, as quote unquote, gasro. Gasro means a, a, a sack, okay? The white embroidery, which I talked about, was to match our sadras. And this type of embroidery became associated completely in India with the Parsis. In the Tagore family in Calcutta, of course, the great Tagores, uh, we are told that they were wearing, quote unquote, Parsi sadis. Parsi sadis never meant the Akki Bareli. It meant a border and a silk sari. And that became the Parsi sari from the time of the early 20th century. Next slide, please. You've got to understand that in the heat of India, wearing a silk sari fully embroidered is not very comfortable, particularly in the days before air conditioning. Uh, the base fabric is something which we have been studying. Ashtin has been working with me on this. We need a lot more researchers to help us. This is the gajji, which is very light because it has its breathing, its breathable fabric. This is the ghat, which in my lifetime and in my research, Dr. Ratan Marshall explained to me in Surat how it was woven beneath water and then coated with a sugar coating for this gloss. 
The weavers were Parsi and we have records from European travelers talking about the skill of Parsi weavers. Uh, we want to revive this weaving. By the way, it is what is called temperate silk. JN Tata, Jamshedji Tata tried to uh, create mulberry trees and revive this weaving in Mysore. This is one of the things he failed at. He in fact brought a Chinese couple to live in Mysore, but it did not work. Now, we really need to revive this because the rest of Indian silk is tropical silk. This is temperate silk. We have been talking to experts in the textile world. We need a lot more money and a lot more researchers to help us study this fabric. Uh, please look at the next slide. We are coming to the end of this whole thing. Uh, you are seeing very clearly an interculture of weaving. Chungtai made in China, Chinni Banavat, and at the edge of this, I have other slides. I'm sorry, I chose this one. You have it written in Chinese, okay? So obviously there was a trade in Saligaj, Surtigat, Gaji between the two countries. We have a lot of pieces of unstitched ijar still with these uh, seals on them. So we really need to study this intercultural trade. Next slide, please. Continuing the intercultural forms, the embellishments in Zar Dozi, Zar Golden Dozi embroidery, real gold and silver thread. Uh, come from the Deccani, Middle Indian, and the Mughal traditions of the court. Uh, this is a very cute, very ugly uh, uh, core, which has a fat little Chinese lady. It's done by a Parsi woman. A huge big peacock, simurg, whatever. A peculiar tree of life. And you can see the difference between the skill over here and the great skill over here. Uh, this, of course, requires a complete uh, webinar of its own. It, is, it belongs to our family and uh, it has the entire story of creation from the Bundaishan. This is King Jamshed. Uh, this is, there's the sacred bull, the tree of life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, if I can have five minutes, is that okay, Anne? I want to talk about uh, this and about tradition. No, next, uh, just go back, please. Thank you. Uh, Parsi women began in the late 20th century, again, wanting garas, which they had earlier cut up and said, who's going to wear these heavy things we want? French chiffon and Chantilly lace. So at their weddings, they wore lace. There's a multicultural bouquet and a garland giving respect to European and Indian tradition. Uh, I want to ask a few questions to this audience. And if Zareen Aros is here, I really want to ask her because just before her mother passed away, I spoke to her on the phone. Mrs. Karani was a great embroiderer. My own mother to whom I dedicate all my textile work was a great designer and Ashtin learned a lot from her. She doted on him and he doted on her. Uh, this lace has been made by a Parsi lady. This is, a, this is my niece wearing her grandmother who was my Masi, her sari for her wedding, okay? This is the lace done by Rati Bapa Sola of, Bom of Bombay. Uh, my mother's wedding sari came from France, from the house of Dior. She was a very fashionable lady. But there is a lady whom I am desperate to find out more about because a lot of my family's wedding trousseaus were made by an Armenian lady called Madame Karosh. If anybody has heard about her, please tell us. Uh, the whole idea of Madame Karosh, Rati Bapa Sola, Hoshed Fani Banda, 
the great Parsi women who constantly kept alive this tradition. The designs of my mother, Kaushit Setna. And next slide, please. Roshan Patel of Hyderabad are recorded, documented uh, records of Parsi women and their embroidery. Our entire embroidery room was donated to the Ahmedabad Zoroastrian Women's uh, Association. I don't know what has happened to those records. Roshan Patel showed us how she made this exact a uh, purse. She taught women of all Indian communities at the Lady Irwin College. Parsi women were the first educators, as Kavita has, uh, uh, as uh, sorry, as Karishma has proved. I want you to note very carefully over here the writing. Many of our kakas had actually written on it, made for X Y Z Navjot, change the color from purple to pink for so and so's wedding, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, on all their kakas. If anyone has these butter paper kakas, please share them, share the photographs with us. These are very valuable documentation. We really need to find out the secrets of how this transmission happened, the notes which Parsi women kept. And I hope that some people in the diaspora have kept these kakas, recognizing at least the sentimental value of a grandmother or a great aunt doing something special. Some garas actually have embroidered in them the name of the Parsi woman who did them. We've heard about these garas. We have not been able to find an example of a name written inside the gara. Now I come to the end. Next slide, please. This is our revival. Today we are going back to our roots. At the Parzor workshops, we are working. This is Roshan Rao in Ahmedabad. This is Nausari. This is a grandmother and her two twin granddaughters. It's not a posed photograph. It is a photograph just photographed spontaneously. It's a lovely picture. Uh, we are working towards a revival of what is Parsi embroidery. The government, next slide please, the government of India has supported us for almost 15 to 17 years. But we really want, next slide please, we want your help. We need, this is the fish garo. Can you see how on top the blank space has been left for tucking in year and year? It's a very heavy sari to wear. Uh, we really need the international Zoroastrian community to play a role, to help us record, to help us document, to help us publish. Uh, next slide, please. Arzo Crafts has won international acclaim. We won the UNESCO Award of Excellence both times in 2008 and 2012. Uh, we need stronger links with museums in Iran. Next slide, please and in China. Uh, this is the way we support our other research and our research in textiles. This is a Parzor uh, Gara. And these are attempts we have done on leather wallets of the Khordad uh, lily, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one person who I hope is watching, but I haven't seen her name, next slide please, is my, yeah, this of course is the Parzor catalog. I, we bring out a catalog every year. This is the Kanda Papeta pattern, onions and potatoes pattern. By the way, it's not onions and potatoes. It's very difficult to get a perfect circle in hand embroidery. These are some pieces from our, uh, from our catalog. Next slide, please. One person who I said has helped us in America is Pearl Sakarawala Ball. She made this doll and wanted Parzor to take it up. She got the little sapat, the kasti, the topi, 
the sadra all done in america it's a delightful gift for a child and i hope that people will encourage pearl and take this on it would make a beautiful navjot gift of course next slide please ashdeen has worked with us as i said he was a favorite of my mother and he loved her elegance and always felt that her four mom's four daughters never required any of the elegance uh the whole point is that these are he's of course used his own interpretation here of the blue and white uh uh ceramics of china and adapted it into this uh modern dress we need to make this a worldwide movement yesterday just yesterday a japanese researcher from textiles asia who saw my interview in the south china um, times i can share that with you all if you are interested got in touch with me we want to make this a worldwide intellectual and artistic revival uh i hope you now see why i have spent 20 years of my life trying to correct a false narrative that parsi garas were made in china and have no zathushti link and please remember next slide please that even today in iran the finest embroidery is still called zarthushti duzi or zoroastrian embroidery thank you so much i hope i haven't taken too much of your time but i hope you found this interesting and we need your help thank you